I wonder if he's altered much. Don't be silly. That was painted when he was about 12. He's nearly 40 now. I only hope he's better tempered than his mean old father was. Shh! It's wicked to speak ill of the dead. When the new master has paid up my wages, perhaps I'll feel better disposed towards the old. Stop your chatter, Jessica! Get on with your work. Sir Percival can be here at any moment now. I hope he'll be bringing some money with him. I have a new go-to-meeting dress to be collected, when I can pay for it. Hold your tongue! Haven't you heard that Sir Percival has made a large fortune in the gold fields of Australia? I've heard so. Then be quiet. The carriage is coming up the drive. Quick, Jessica, fix the others. Tell them Sir Percival is here. On behalf of the servants, may I extend you a cordial welcome, Sir Percival? You may, my man. You, I take it, are my butler? I am, Sir Percival. And you? Mrs. Bullen, your housekeeper. How long have you been in service here? Eighteen years. And you don't remember me as a boy? No, Sir Percival. Are there any servants here who do? No. I regret to say none, sir. Pity. Great pity. Servants are waiting to greet you, Sir Percival. You can all go about your business. Last girl but one. The dimples, the neat ankles. What duties does she perform? Those of a parlourmaid, Sir Percival. Oh, so she will bring me up my hot water tomorrow morning, eh? No, uh, she's not allowed in the bedroom, Sir Percival. Indeed, and why not? Because she's a parlourmaid. From now on, she's a chambermaid. I want her to bring me up my water in the morning. Will it please you to see Mr. Merriman now, Sir Percival? Mr. Merriman? Your old family lawyer. One of the few people who do remember you when you were a boy. Oh, yes, of course. Dear old Merry boy. Man. Mr. Merry Man, Sir Percival. Oh, yes, of course. Merriman. So he knew me when I was a boy, did he? Yes. Will you see him? No, no, I... I don't think I'll bother with him now. He's waiting for you in the library. Oh, well, I might as well get it over. Where do you say he is? In the library. And the library is, uh, still in the same place? Yes, Sir Percival. Perhaps it would be as well if you would go in first. <laughs> Sir Percival Glyde, Mr. Merriman. Hearty greetings, Sir Percival. How do you do? Pray be seated, sir. I trust your long and arduous journey has not taxed you unduly. I can best answer your question, sir, by reminding you that I've spent the greater part of my life in the wilds. Of course, of course. Now, let me see. How many years is it since we last met? Oh, a great many, I'm afraid. I'd never have known you again. No, and I should never have known you. <laughs> but there, time does alter one, doesn't it? Yes, yes. Uh, well, it remains for me to hand everything over to you and give you an account of my stewardship. A just and an honest one, I know. My dear sir. My very dear sir. <laughs> I have here a copy of your account at the banking house of Stukely, Cobbled and Cobbled. You will see here that your balance stands at 15,782 pounds, 18 shillings and fivepence. Is that so? 
I would point out the reason it stands in this figure is that all your interests have been paid. Interest? On the mortgages. Well, my mortgages? Yes. Oh, then the interests are all in. No. All out. Why? What do you mean? Is it possible you don't know that this house is mortgaged? Mortgaged? Yes. And the furniture. Furniture? And the estate. Estate? And all the timber on the estate. And, well, in fact, everything's mortgaged. Then what did my father leave me? He left a debt of 15,782 pounds, 18 shillings and five pence. Then why not pay it off with that? But, but that is the debt. It's not a credit balance, my dear sir. It's an overdraft. What? Mr. Cobble was delighted to hear you were returning. It's a bigger overdraft than he likes. But with the vast fortune you've accumulated in the gold fields of Australia, uh, you will soon wipe that off. And who told you I'd accumulated a vast fortune? <laughs> but haven't you? I have not! Oh, but your father! It was his cherished hope that you'd come back and place Blackwater on its feet again. Oh, it was, was it? That, I feel sure, is the reason he repented of his attitude towards you. I have but 60 sovereigns as a reward for years of sweat and privation. Bless myself. Oh, a fine homecoming for a man, I must say. So far, Sir Percival, you've only heard the debit side of your account. We haven't yet touched on the credit side. Is there a credit side? Before we proceed any further, Sir Percival, it's my duty to satisfy myself formally as to your identity, or merely as a matter of legal form, of course. Well, apart from this signet ring, there are several letters from my father and my luggage, together with a letter from you notifying me of his death. And the oval-shaped mole on your right hip. Danny, sir, are you asking me to remove my trousers? Uh, 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 we will waive the question of the mole. Uh, uh, won't you sit down? Now, tell me about this credit side. Doubtless you will remember your father's very old and dear friend, Mr. Frederick Fairley. Oh, yes, yes, of course. It was your father's dearest wish that you should marry Mr. Fairley's niece and ward, Laura. Very kind of him, I'm sure. The lady is young and comely, I hope. Yes, she is young, barely of age. As to whether she is comely, I cannot say. I've not met her. But that point is of no importance. May not be to you. It is of importance to me if she's to share my bed. What I think is important is that her father left her a hundred thousand pounds. The devil he did! Do you mean she's to take my overdraft in exchange for me? It would be wiser not to mention the overdraft to Mr. Fairley until after you are married. Hasn't the young lady anything to say about it? Dutiful and obedient young ladies do as their guardians wish. I only trust that you will do as your father wished. Hundred thousand. How could I disobey my dear old father? When may I see the young lady? Here's Mr. Fairley's address. Write and tell him at your home and ask his permission to pay your addresses to his niece. I'm wondering what Uncle will think of this when he sees it. My dear Laura, has Uncle ever said he was pleased with anything we say or do? No. Then why wonder what he will think of your painting? Mr. Hartwright is pleased with it. During the three months Mr. Hartwright has been your tutor, has he ever been displeased with anything you say or do? Really, Marion, I... Marion, <laughs> I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> Louis, the inhalant, quick! How dare you disseminate your beastly germs in this room? If you have a cold, stay in bed, don't give it to me. Am I not ill enough already? Oh, is there some conspiracy going on in this wretched house? Do you all want to hound me into a madhouse? You know very well that the slightest sound runs through me like a knife. And yet you, Mr. Hartwright, must go and bang the door. Oh, I'm very sorry, sir. I was under the impression that I closed it quite quiet. And don't argue with me. Don't argue. I'm far too ill. Far too ill. My smelling salts, Louis. My smelling salts. Well, Miss Laura, and how's the work progressing? Ah, a little indefinite, I feel. But shows a decided improvement. You're an apt pupil. As I am paying for my niece's tuition, perhaps I may be permitted to see for myself what progress, if any, they are making. But certainly, sir, of course. Miss Laura's work shows decided improvement and a marked degree of talent. But it shows up in a marked degree the young lady's sad defects, and that these lessons are a waste of time and money. Now leave me, all of you. Leave me in peace. You fidget me. You, you, you set my nerves on edge. Uh, Laura, you will stay behind. Your memory is not faulty. I don't think so, Uncle Frederick. Then you will not have forgotten your father's wishes, that you should marry Percival. 
the son of the late Sir Felix Glyde. I had not forgotten. Well, Sir Percival Glyde is coming here shortly to pay his addresses to you. But, Uncle, I don't want to think of marriage yet. I knew we should have trouble with you. You're always troublesome governesses, drawing masters. I never know whether I'm on my head or my heels. I will receive Sir Percival Glyde at his convenience. Now, please, go away. You're setting my nerves on edge again. Louis, my smelling salts! Oh, not those salts, idiot, the other, the lavender salts. Was there ever such an unfortunate man as me? Fool of a valet and a heartless and unmanageable nieces. And pray, where are you going to, my pretty maid? I'm going to empty the slops, sir. Slops? You'll find you've got a lot of new duties. Now you're transferred to this part of the house. Yes, Sir Percival. They tell me there's a shortcut through the fields to the village. You know it, eh? Yes, Sir Percival. I've forgotten its exact whereabouts. The moon will be full tonight. Would you show me the cut? Yes, Sir Percival. Splendid. Then meet me at the lower gate tonight at eight. And if you're the sensible little girl that I think you're going to be, that old scarecrow of a housekeeper, She'll find some more pleasant duty for you, for these dainty little fingers. Excuse me, Sir Percival. What is it? Lady and gentlemen to see you, Sir Percival. Dr. Isidore Fusco? Who's he? I don't know. I've never seen him before. And the lady whose name he's written here, Mrs. Caffrey. Who is she? I can't say. I've shown them into the library. Come to pay their respects to the new squire, no doubt. I would that I could have been spared this ordeal. Oh, come, come, my good lady. The fact that I, Fosco, am here to speak on your behalf, to shoulder your troubles, in fact, is a guarantee that your feelings will be respected to the utmost. Have I the honor of addressing Sir Percival Glyde? I am Sir Percival Glyde at your service. And I am your humble and obedient servant, Isidore Fosco, Doctor of Medicine. And uh, the lady? Uh, well, I wrote the name on my card. I thought it might be familiar to you. Mrs. Catherick? Well, uh, can I assist your memory with one little word? Love? A youthful romance? An early peccadillo? What? Resulting in the, uh, <clears throat> the birth of a child? A child? A female child born eight months after you set sail for Australia. And what has that to do with me? Do, well, really, sir, it's not a question somewhat indelicate. Are you accusing me of being the father of this lady's child? Uh, Mrs. Catherick brings the charge, sir, not I. A foul, beastly lie. I've had the law upon you. For I have never set eyes on this woman before. I withdraw the charge. The gentleman speaks truth. I have never set eyes on him before. Oh, so you've changed your tune. That is well for you, madam. I, I am bewildered, completely bewildered. What does all this mean? that he is not the father of my daughter. But you assured me that Sir Percival Glyde... I did, but he is not Sir Percival Glyde. What the devil are you talking about? Have you taken leave of your senses? Are you quite sure? Are you positive you're not making a grave mistake? You realize that you're branding this gentleman as an imposter? Oh, the woman is mad. She should be in an asylum. The gentleman can prove me wrong by letting me put to him a few simple questions. Questions that the real Sir Percival Glyde would have no difficulty in answering. And I refuse to be questioned or cross-examined. This is either insanity or blackmail. I leave others to determine which. Meanwhile, leave my house at once. Both of you. Show these people out. I, um, I forgot my cane. Excuse me. Would it not be...
be better to take me into your confidence? Have a drink. No, thank you. I do not indulge. And I do not trust teetotalers. I was going to say that I do not indulge at this time of day. Kindly inform me as briefly as you can. What brought you and your female companion here? I will be discretion itself. You will have gathered that over 20 years ago, the lady was very much enamored of uh, yourself. And there was a daughter. Yes, I've gathered that. What's she like? Oh, beautiful. Beautiful, but um, highly strung. Occasionally, somewhat unbalanced, poor thing. Mental? At times, at others, as normal as you would be. She's safely out of the way. I am a mental specialist, sir. She is in my private asylum. And what is the nature of her madness? A relentless hatred of her father whom she considers has wronged her mother past forgiveness. She is safely guarded, I hope. All my patients are. And uh, <clears throat> my charges are very modest. Don't look to me for payment. I have other things to do with my money. She'd better be transferred to the public asylum. Uh, that will, of course, necessitate the disclosure to the public authorities of the girl's parentage. But your secret is safe with me. I bid you good day, sir. Laura Fairley. One moment, Fosco. I feel, after all, that I do owe this poor child something. Uh, admirable sentiment, sir. Most laudable. I have the account with me. I cannot settle with you now. Shortly you shall receive your dues and more. I shall be most happy to accommodate you, sir. And this woman, Catherick, she's to be trusted. Oh. She won't tittle-tattle. <laughs> have no fear. Her love for her daughter will prevent that. And now just one final word to you, Dr. Isidore Fosco. Be loyal to your trust, and it will pay you handsomely. Betray it, and I'll feed your entrails to the pigs. I bid you good day, sir. <laughs> Did you tell him I was secretly married to Percival Glyde before he went to Australia? Well, what would have been the use? The man is patently an imposter. I shall expose him. Would that provide you with the money to pay me for keeping your daughter in the comfort of my asylum? Oh, what shall I do? You do nothing. But I can't let my poor girl go into a public asylum. I can't. I can't. She will remain in my charge, and the pseudo Sir Percival Glyde shall pay. But I... Now, keep your own counsel. Don't breathe a word to a living soul. Leave everything to me. I've come to say goodbye, Laura. Goodbye? I leave for London today. Today? Would you have me stay in the circumstances? So you know, then. Your sister's just told me. What must you think of me? Only what I've always thought of you. I've wanted to tell you before, but lacked the courage. Oh, Paul, I don't want to lose what little happiness I've known. Oh, I'm glad you've been happy. More than I can ever say. I've been hoping against hope that my future husband would never return from Australia. That perhaps he might... Oh, I suppose it was wicked of me to hope that. Our stations in life are so different. I should never have presumed to ask you to marry me. I should have been quite content to have gone on just adoring you from afar. I shall always continue to do that. Always. Here he is. I can't face him. I can't. I must go. Oh, don't leave me. At least not at once. Please, I beg of you. Quick promise. Very well. I shall ask Mr. Fairley to release me at the end of the month. My sister Laura, Sir Percival Glyde. I count myself fortunate indeed that my bride-to-be is so charming and so gracious. Our drawing master, Mr. Hartwright, Sir Percival. A drawing master? What an odd occupation. Truly, as it said, it takes all sorts to make a world. If you'll please excuse me. And I too, Sir Percival. Certainly, certainly. They told me that you were beautiful, but I hardly dared to hope... Won't you be seated? Sir Percival, do you believe in first impressions? Indeed, yes. First impressions are always right, and I feel for you... I am glad, and I beg of you now, at this our first meeting, to release me from this contract. But that's impossible. I beg of you, Sir Percival. You ask too much. Why, when we are married, and friendship has ripened into love, see, it fits perfectly. A good augury for our future happiness. You like it? Thank you. 
An engagement is usually sealed with a kiss. So, Percival, please, please. Dad, how lovely you are. My uncle will be awaiting you in his room. If you will excuse me, I will retire. Before you go to him, I may say I've arranged for our wedding to take place on Michaelmas Day. Michaelmas Day? Why, that's barely six weeks away. I couldn't consent to an engagement of less than a year. That is ridiculous. After 20 years in the lonely wilds, I feel the need of a wife's comfort and companionship. I'm afraid I must insist. Then I think I'd better speak to your uncle forthwith. I will ring for a servant. Please take this gentleman to Mr. Fairley. <laughs> Don't cry, Laura, dear. You're not married to him yet. That dreadful man insists that I marry him on six weeks from today. So soon? But that's ridiculous. And anyway, the question of time is for the woman to decide. Uncle Frederick wrote to tell him that he could decide the wedding day. They won't have it all their own way. Let them have their way. Let us have no more troubles and heart burnings that any sacrifice of mine can prevent. Oh, say you will live with me, Marion, when I'm married. Say no more. Marion Crow once sat on a tree singing, Hey, Derry, Derry, down Dee. Hey, Derry, Derry, down Dee. The old crow that sat on a... Hello, Hawkins! A carrion crow once sat on a tree singing, Hey, Derry, Hey, Derry, Dee. It's impossible. Well, what is it? Oh, take that miserable look off your face. Blackwater is to have a mistress. A mistress, Sir Percival? A wife. I'm going to be married. Allow me to congratulate you, Sir Percival. <laughs> Dr. Fosco is awaiting you in the library, Sir Percival. Fosco? <laughs> he won't keep me long. Oh, and when he's gone, Hawkins, send Jessica to me here. I've certain instructions to give her. <laughs> <laughs> ah, my dear Fosco, this is indeed a pleasure. And how are you, eh? Well, uh, physically, I am well, but... I was never better myself. Uh, if you will excuse me, I won't... Uh... Oh, but you will. Um? You will drink my health, friend Fosco. Why? For I am to be married. Oh, uh, uh, indeed? To Miss Laura Ferry of Limeridge Hall, uh -huh. a lady... Rich and beautiful. Well, may I offer my congratulations to both of you, sir? Thanks, thanks. And now about this paltry sum I owe you. What does it amount to? Uh, 152 pounds. <laughs> A mere bagatelle. And I will pay you two years' fees in advance. Satisfactory? Well, eminently so, Sir Percival. I... For I am to be rich, friend Fosco. <laughs> All my troubles are over. I fear your troubles are only just beginning, Sir Percival. Eh? Anne Catherick has escaped from my asylum. What? Yes, most regrettable. You uh, blundering fool! Oh, no, Sir Percival, please. Just... I please you. I have a mind to shake the breath from out of your greasy little body. Now listen to me. If you wish to escape with your miserable life, you'll find her quickly. Oh, that this should have happened at a moment like this. Just when everything... Yes, I understand have you. Have you made any plans for her recapture? Have you been to see her mother? Yes, I have. She'll report to me immediately the girl goes back. And what else? Well, I've invited myself here as your guest. I brought a little light luggage and I propose to stay the night. And how the devil do you expect to find her from this house? Because her insane hatred of you is bound to bring her here with the intention of venting her spleen upon you. And have you organized a search party? I suppose no. I have arranged a thorough and systematic search over a wide area. Come in. Did you want me, Sir Percival? Yes, that is. <clears throat> uh, with your permission, I will go to bed, Sir Percival. I've had a strenuous day and I... That's right. Call Hawkins and tell him to take Dr. Fosco up to a bedroom. And then come back here for your instructions. Yes, Sir Percival. Good night, Sir Percival. I assure you, this lamentable business will be brought to a speedy conclusion. I hope so, for both our sakes.
The butler is waiting for you in the hall, sir. Thank you. Red lips and red wine for the rest of the evening, eh, my pretty? But why so downcast, child? What's amiss? They tell me you're going to be married. Oh, ho, ho, so that's the trouble, is it? Come, sit you down here. Love and marriage are two very different things. Marriage is a business proposition, whereas love... We drink to love tonight. Yes, but... But what? Well, marriage is safer for a girl, isn't it? And you promised you'd marry me. And I'm not a man to betray a maiden under an idle promise of marriage, but... Oh, I know Miss Fell is a very rich lady. And a few weeks ago, I would have been content. But now... <laughs> oh, what will become of me? <laughs> you... you mean? <laughs> you haven't breathed the word of this to a living soul? Oh, no, sir. But you see, this changes everything. You must marry me now, mustn't you? Yes, yes, of course. You mean that, sir? My word is my bond. But not a mention of this to anyone. It shall be our little secret, eh? Oh, I'm so happy. Upon my soul, you're a delightful little baggage. Oh, Sir Percival. Ah! What the devil? There! There at the window! At the window? What do you mean? A woman! A woman in white! A woman in white? What are you talking about? Look! What's the matter? Ah! Ghosts! Ghosts! The house is haunted! Oh. Ghosts? The house haunted? Ghosts? Housebreakers. No, an apparition. What, really, you mean? A woman dressed all in white. Anne Catherick. Anne Catherick? I said she'd come here. But what are you waiting for? Go on, find her. Not like this, but I haven't got my trousers on. Curse your trousers. Curse you. Oh, curse everything. Sir Percival Glyde. I'm afraid it's too late, sir. I think Sir Percival has retired. Oh, no, he hasn't. What the devil do you want? Your explanation of this, which I saw a woman pin on the nearest board of the parish church, not an hour since. Why, what the devil? Well, what do you say to it? All falsehoods, a tissue of lies from beginning to end. I wonder. And let me tell you this, if you try to defame my character in the smallest degree, I'll swear out a warrant for your arrest. And if you harm so much as a single hair of Miss Laura Fairley's head or cause her one moment's pain or unhappiness, I'll make you regret it as long as you live, Sir Percival Glyde. Do you realize you're speaking to the Lord of the Manor? That makes not one tittle of difference to what I just said. Get out, or I'll set the dogs on you. Oh, so you heard, eh? Oh, well, the door was open. I really couldn't help that. That mad fool is up to her tricks already. She's got to be found. Do you hear me? She's got to be found. Of course, I share your anxiety, Sir Percival. Mm. Have I not a stake in your marriage to the tune of 152 pounds? An extra hundred to you when she's safely under lock and key. But I thought you were financially embarrassed. Then I'll give you an IOU for a hundred pounds to be redeemed as soon as I'm married. Oh, another hundred pounds. <clears throat> oh, Sir Percival. Well, what do you want? You didn't used to talk to me like that. And you used not to look like that. Oh. Going about the house like a glass of sour milk. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake, girl, time be bright. <laughs> you know why I'm unhappy, sir. Shh, shh, shh. Come in here. <laughs> oh, 
Now what are you sniveling for? My mother. You haven't told her? No, sir, not a word. But she's begun to. She's asking questions, and you promised. I know, and I'll keep my word. We're going to leave all this, Jessica. You mean, elope and get married, and I shall be Lady Glyde? Yes, tonight. I'll take you to a place where you'll be nice and peaceful, where no one will ever know. You mean that, Sir Passive? Of course I mean it. Meet me at nine o'clock tonight in the old boathouse by the lake. Oh, that place scares me in daylight. But at night... But I shall be there, and then you won't be afraid, will you? Oh, no, Percival. I mean, sir. That's right. Then go and pack yourself a few things. You're going on a journey. Yes. A very long journey. <laughs> Here I am, my dear, waiting for you. I'm so glad you didn't keep me waiting. I was so afraid. But you're not afraid now, are you? Oh, no, sir. What do you do when you're afraid? Do you scream? Sometimes. Do you feel like screaming now? Oh, no. No, we mustn't make a noise or someone would hear us. And that would never do, would it? No, sir. But I needn't call you sir now. We're going to be married, need I? Hadn't we better be getting along? Just one little kiss first. Percival! You're hurting me! <laughs> <laughs> so you wanted to be a bride, my dear Jessica, did you? So you shall be a bride of death. <laughs> God bless you, Mr. Marshall. Good luck to you both. Aye, long love and happiness to you both. Thank you, thank you all. Lady. Mrs. Bullen, this is your new mistress, Lady Glyde. Welcome home, my lady. Thank you. And this is Lady Glyde's sister, who will be staying with Lady Glyde. Come, my dear. Well, my dear, how do you like your new home? Charming old place, isn't it? It has an atmosphere. All of its own. As you say, there certainly is an atmosphere. I'm afraid we're short-staffed, my lady. One of the maids vanished into thin air a short while since. Mrs. Bullen, please show the ladies upstairs. Can you come this way? That is Miss Fairy's room, my lady, at the top of the stairs. You, of course, will occupy Sir Percival's suite. Uh, 
I have placed the table on the left-hand side, my lady. Doubtless by tomorrow you and Sir Percival will have decided which side of the bed you will occupy. My room is a long way from this one. Yes, it is, isn't it? Come, my little bride. Cheer up. This is your wedding night. Have a drink. It'll bring a smile to your pretty face. No, thank you. No, no. Always no. You must learn that a wife must sometimes say yes to her husband. And you, Sir Percival, should know that there are times when a husband must show his wife consideration. Ah, my pretty little sister-in-law. You're a woman of spirit. Champion of the oppressed sex, eh? Well, I like women of spirit. Here's to the taming of the shrew. Won't you drink to the bride and bridegroom? I have done so already. Well, you will. Please excuse me. Why should I? I'm always excusing you. I say you shall drink. No, no, please. But you can't. I'll make you. So possible, please. My sister and I have had a very long and tiring day. Perhaps we may be permitted to retire. Certainly. I ring for Mrs. Bull. This way, ladies. I shall be joining you very soon, my dear. I wonder what it feels like to be a bride. How should I know? Must I be placed so far away from Lady Glyde? It's the nearest available room to Sir Percival's suite. I've been in with the warming pan. Good night, my lady. She shan't spoil my wedding night, curse her. Do people think that I'm made of money? In accordance with your instructions, I've drawn up this document. Good. If you can persuade Lady Glyde to sign it, you will have immediate control of her fortune. But will she? She has promised to love, honor, and obey. In any case, you will jointly enjoy the income on her money. And don't forget, too, that if she dies first, everything is left entirely to you. In other words, I should be better off if she were dead. Suppose. Well, that's what you mean, isn't it? And has it ever struck you that she might alter her will? in somebody else's favor at any time she likes. But she's not likely to do that. But supposing she hears something, something that upsets her, what then? You mean there is something? I only said supposing. However, 
her signature to this document and then... Shh. I'm sorry, I was looking for Marion. Come in, my dear. I was just going to send for you, as it happens. Oh? You've met my lawyer, Mr. Merriman? Yes, we introduced ourselves when he arrived. With your permission, Sir Percival, I'll withdraw while you speak to Lady Glyde. As you will. I'll join you in a minute. Yes, sir. Come here, my dear. Just a little matter of business, but I want you to sign your name. Just there, opposite that wafer. What is it I am to sign? Oh, it's minor importance or mere formality. But surely I ought to know what I'm signing before I write my name. Nonsense, my dear. What do women know about business? If I explained it, you wouldn't understand it. At any rate, let me try to understand it. Mr. Gilmore, whenever he had any business for me to do, always explained it first, and I always understood him. I dare say he did. He was your lawyer. It was his duty to explain. But I am your husband. Where do you want me to sign? There. If my signature pledges me to anything, I feel I have some claim to know what that pledge is. You distrust me, is that it? It's unjust and cruel to accuse me of distrusting you. Aren't I entitled to know what this writing requires of me before I sign it? So you do distrust me. You distrust your own husband. Upon my soul, this is more than flesh and blood can stand. I wish Marion were here to advise me. Marion is here. What is it you want my advice on, Nora? This document I'm signing. What document? A mere formality, but as essential as the register that she signed in the church. But that was open before me. Why is this all folded up? Oh, heaven preserve me from doing business with women. Are you going to sign that, or are we going to argue all day? But Laura's objection seems perfectly reasonable to me. A cool declaration upon my soul. Before you invite yourself into a man's house the next time, let me recommend you not to abuse his hospitality by taking sides with his wife against him in a matter which does not concern you. Shall I sign? I will if you say so. No. The right and the truth are with you. Sign nothing unless you have read it first. You positively refuse, then, to give me your signature? After what you have just said to Marion, I refuse my signature until I have read every line in that parchment from first to last. Come on, Marion. Laura. Laura, you know I would do anything in the world for you. But I cannot possibly stay here after what your husband said to me. I'm afraid... He lost his temper. A man speaks his mind in temper. I'll visit you, my dear. I'll visit you every day of my life. But I cannot possibly remain under this roof any longer. Oh, my poor darling. Sir Percival, look. A letter addressed to Lady Glyde in Anne Catherick's handwriting. What? Are you sure it's Anne Catherick's handwriting? Positive. I've seen it often enough. How'd you get it? Well, walking up to Jai just now, I overtook the postboy and took the letters from him. My God, if Laura had seen this, this lunatic girl must be recaptured. You're quite sure she's not at her mother's? Absolutely certain. I'm having the place watched night and day. Mrs. Catherick admits seeing her two or three times since her escape. Yes, only at night, through the window. By the time Mrs. Catherick's got outside, she's always disappeared completely. Yes, so she says. The girl loves her mother, eh? With an intensity only equaled by her hatred of you. And where the mother is, the girl won't be far away. Get a message to Mrs. Catholic. Tell her to meet me tonight at nine in the old boathouse by the lake. <laughs> Good day, Mrs. Catherick. <laughs> you better send me up a pot of that bear's grease. It's nice and soothing. Thank you. I'll send it over today. And I shan't want you again until next Tuesday week. Thank you, Sir Percival. And I wish you good day, sir. Good day to you. Good day. Good day. Good day. <clears throat> Fosco, I didn't hear you knock. I came in just as you were speaking about poor Mrs. Catholic. Made away with herself, eh? And at Blackwater Lake, too. You met her there, didn't you? She didn't come. I cooled my heels for nearly an hour. Ah, then you won't have a chance of seeing her again, eh? 
and her secret will die with her. The devil are you talking about? Dead women tell no tales, but uh, was it quite wise? You sneaking little rat! Mm -hmm. What do you mean? Right. As a doctor and a loyal citizen, I have but one duty to perform at the inquest. As a loyal friend, I have another. How loyal a friend are you? How loyal are you? How loyal do you want me to be? To the extent of a promissory note of 5,000 pounds to be redeemed when you've robbed your wife of her money. You! Yes, I'm afraid it must be 5,000 pounds. That's why I said I wondered if you were quite wise. Now, do you agree? Send me a promissory note and I'll sign it. Thank you, Sir Percival. The price may be high, but the risk is great. I wonder if you realize how great the risk really is. <laughs> There is your woman in white. A little hunting trick I learned in Australia. Kill the mother, and the whelps will follow the body. So this is the cause of all the trouble, eh? <laughs> Our little mad girl. <laughs> Laura. Lady Glyde. Oh, no. There is a remarkable resemblance, certainly, particularly when the face is in repose. Why didn't you tell me of this before? Can't you see the solution of all our troubles? Is he here? Very ill. Probably pneumonia. We must get her between blankets immediately. You seem very concerned for her. My instinct as a doctor is to cure, not to kill. <laughs> Let's get her back to the coach. There's only one thing to do. Sweat it out of her. Only about at night, scantily clad. No wonder she's grievously ill. Ah, I must get this heated up again. It's essential she be kept as warm as possible. There may be a change for the better in the morning. Maybe a change for the better in the morning. <laughs> Catherine, unless you want to find yourself in a jagged, you'll calm yourself. My name is not Anne Catherick. Oh, please, listen to me. I am Lady Glyde. Lady Glyde, don't you understand? Oh, 
I deeply regret that Lady Glyde is most seriously ill. Was there ever such an unfortunate man as I am? There's Laura taken ill and I am pestered with it. I always thought that when a girl was married, she was off her guardian's hands. What am I expected to do about it? Something I would never expect you to do. Forget your miserable self for one moment and think of someone else. Are you aware of what you're saying and to whom you're saying it? Yes. To the man who undertook to be her guardian and betrayed his trust. Who didn't care whom she married or what became of her, so long as he wasn't inconvenienced. You fill me with contempt. You're so much engrossed in your own imaginary ailments that you haven't an atom of pity or consideration for anyone else. If anything happens to Laura, may God punish you as you deserve. Louis, my salvolatile, my salvolatile, I take the lot and my notice with it, and I hope you'll never get the stains out. <laughs> Where is Laura? In her room. How is she? She's been very feverish, restless and wandering. She's quiet now. Oh, yes, she's quiet now. Then that is a good sign, surely, isn't it? It means she's better, doesn't it? In the sense that she's no longer suffering. She is better. Great heavens! Are you telling me something's happened to her? Oh, please, if you have any womanly feeling in you, listen to me. Now you be quiet and eat your food. Please, please believe me when I tell you that a ghastly mistake has been made. You made the mistake, Anne Catherick, when you thought you could give us the slip. My name is not Anne Catherick. I tell you I'm Lady Glyde. That's nothing. The one in there is Anne Boleyn. But I am Lady Glyde. <laughs> Lady Glyde died two days ago. It's in the papers. Good morning, Doctor. Oh, Doctor Fosco, I am glad you're here. Have you come to take me out of this dreadful place? My dear Anne, why should I take you away when I've just welcomed you back? But don't you know who I am? Yes, 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 my dear girl. Of course I know who you are. You know I'm Lady Glyde. She was carrying on like this before you came, sir. But it's true. It's true. Mm, she's doubtless read of Lady Glyde's death and the brain... Will you send for my sister? Please, please, please do as I ask and send for her. <laughs> Poor child, poor child, it is, it's, it's worse than I thought. Yes, of course we will send for her. I watch her carefully. If she continues like this, I'll give her a strong sedative. But uh, if she becomes violent... Um... No! No! Don't you see you are making a dreadful mistake? Dr. Fosco! Dr. Fosco, don't leave me! Don't leave me! Well, she's safe enough. Good. The question is, how safe are we? What do you mean? Well, at every step we seem to be getting deeper and deeper. She might as well be locked up for all the good she is. Of what use is a shrinking violet to a man? A brief interview with her lawyers on Monday, and I shall be rich, my Fosco. So come, I'll stand you a bottle of wine at the Falcon on the strength of it. Uh, thank you, but I do not indulge. And I've already told you I don't trust teetotalers. Well, I was going to say that I do not indulge except at this time of day. Good. Come, my Fosco. Come. I wish I could find that woman in white. If you were to find her, that wouldn't bring the dead back to life. No, but it might bring the living to justice. I swear by that grave to expose Glyde to the world for the blackguardly scoundrel that he is. I feel certain that that woman can point me the way. What makes you so certain? The look I saw in Glyde's eyes when I confronted him with her note. I wonder if... If what? A few days ago, a girl 
said to be a mental case who escaped from Dr. Fosker's asylum, was recaptured near Blackwater. You think she might be the woman in white? I wondered if there might be any connection. I heard one of the servants say she was dressed all in white. I wonder. I should go mad! I should go mad! Why am I here? Oh, let me out! What have I done? Let me out! Gentlemen, I see you, sir. Mr. Carey Wilson, solicitor Winchester? What's he want? Don't know, sir. You'd better show him in, I suppose. This way, sir. And what service can I render you, sir? You have a patient here named Anne Catherick. That is so. I'm engaged in winding up the estate of her recently deceased mother. Won't you sit down? Uh, thank you. I require certain information. May I see Miss Catherick? Quite impossible. My instructions are that she may have no visitors. But it's vitally important. I repeat, it's impossible. You realize, sir, the girl's insane? Has she been certified? Well, no, not actually, and in but... in law, she's sane until she's been certified. I must insist on seeing her. For the last time, sir, I cannot grant your request. Very well. And in that case, I must apply for an order to the court. Oh, my, my dear sir, there's no need to adopt that attitude. After all, rules must be observed in these institutions. And the law must take its course? Quite. Well, under the very special circumstances, I'll make an exception in your case. Take this gentleman through to number seven. She's been rather violent, Doctor. You must not excite her. You understand? This way, sir. Excuse me. Paul. Laura. Oh, Paul, I hoped, I prayed you would come. Why do you stare at me? Do I look so different? Oh, I never expected to find you here. Oh, thank God I did. Whom did you expect to find? A girl called Anne Catherick. Anne Catherick? That's what they insist on calling me, even Dr. Foscoe. Oh, my darling. Those two scoundrels should pay for this. Oh, please, please take me out of this dreadful place. You'll have to go now. Very well. Thank you, Miss Catherick. I think that clears up everything quite satisfactorily. Take that to my bankers and... What is this? A draft in respect to the upkeep of Anne Catherick for three years. And the additional hundred promised me for her recapture? But you didn't recapture her. I did. And then there's the five thousand due to me for committing perjury in your interest at the inquest on Mrs. Catherick. Blackmail, eh? You know well enough what was arranged between us. That's all you're going to get, you little worm. Take it or leave it. You don't get over me so easily as that. I know you are not Sir Percival Glyde. I know you murdered Mrs. Catherick and caused the death of her daughter, to say nothing of the parlour maid Jessica and the real Sir Percival Glyde. I also know that the woman at present in my asylum is Laura Fairley, and that the body buried in Limeridge Churchyard is that of Anne Catherick, alias Glyde. But you've no proof of all this. It's only your word against mine. Besides, the story is so fantastic. Who would believe it? I, for one, believe every word of it. Oh, eavesdropping, I... eh? What have you heard? 
enough to hang you for the murderer that you are. He's got no proof. Oh, you want proof, do you? Well, I know where I can find proof. In the records of the parish church. What records? If you were Sir Percival Glyde, you would not ask. For it was there that Percival Glyde, before he set out for Australia, married the woman that you knew was Mrs. Catholic. What? Then who is he? An imposter! A murderer! A thief! A liar and a bigamist! And the records of the parish church shall prove it to the world! <laughs> oh, no, you don't! <laughs> <laughs> Wenches like you want taming badly, properly taming. Let me go, you horrible beast! Let me go! <laughs> in Australia, I used to break in fractious horses. Now I'm going to break in a fractious mare. <laughs> for this, and that criminal lunatic will pay his just desert. Hangman's rope. I don't think you expected me, my Vasco. I you little treacherous little snake. Oh, I've been longing to sink my fingers in your fat, greasy little throat. No, 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 not that, not that. Then not that, that, eh? He said, the hangman's rope, and the hangman's rope it shall be. <laughs> You always said you were a teetotaler. You're going to have a nice drop. Now. <laughs> What's that? The church bell. The parish records. Run to the church, quickly. Destroy the records and beat them yet. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's on fire! Hounds are after me! 